Jesus promises that we'll never go thirsty. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to um, begin with two sayings. The first is a greeting that the ancient church, people in the ancient church gave one another during Lent. It's not a real feel-good saying, but here's what they said when they passed the peace. Pray for me, your sinful brother. Or pray for me, your sinful sister. Not a real happy greeting, but one that would certainly humble us. The second saying is from Augustine. And he says, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see to it that they do not remain that way. I think that statement reflects what is going on in our gospel text today. Let me begin with a story. This happened three years ago in Ohio. A church, a new church, started up. It was Oh, about a block away from a adult entertainment nightclub. And this church said, oh, we've got to do something about that adult entertainment nightclub so close to us. So, of course, what do church people think of? Let's go pick it. I guess like um, uh, Fred Phelps uh, would do. And they even got to the point of, of uh, calling the, the, the women dancers as they went into the establishment, calling them names. Well, the owner of the nightclub said, well, two can play that game. So he paid his dancers to go put on bikinis and picket the church. And other patrons of this establishment went, went and picketed the church. So there was this real animosity going on. A ministry in San Diego, California heard about it, and the ministry in San Diego, California was a ministry to uh, people, women in particular, who were in the adult entertainment industry to help them redeem their lives and get out of that business. They were called J.C.'s daughters, and uh, Jesus Christ's daughters, and they... Um, they flew to Ohio, went to the nightclub and met with the people there and told the uh, women in, who were the entertainers their story, told them about the gospel, told them about the love of God. And then on Sunday morning they went to the church and they talked to the church as they were being picketed out in front. And then they asked the church, Will you come with me? Will you come with us and go outside and talk to the people picketing and show them the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God? So the congregation went outside and they had a time where they talked and shared and accepted one another. And that was the beginning of a relationship with some of the, the people that would help change their lives. In our Gospel lesson we have a story. Jesus goes to, to Samaria now, most Jews in Jesus' time, a vast majority, could live their lives out just fine with never going to Samaria. And it always bothers me that Jesus does these things that he knows is going to get himself into trouble. But he does it anyway. And if I had been one of his disciples, I said, Jesus, don't go to Samaria. 
Instead, that's exactly where Jesus goes. A good Jew, if we went to Samaria, it was a place where you would become ceremonially unclean. The Samaritans, to Jews, there was a, a centuries-long feud going on. The Samaritans were the descendants of all those people that were left behind during the Babylonian captivity. So they were all the uneducated people, all the poor people, who were left behind in Israel and Jerusalem. And when the colonists came in, they intermarried with the colonists. And the Samaritans believed in only the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the Torah. And they believed that the Pentateuch, according to Moses, the place to worship was Mount Gerizim. And they eventually did build a temple on Mount Gerizim. When the Jews came back from, when the Hebrew people came back from the Babylonian captivity, they were appalled at the way the Samaritans were living. That's, they got the name Samaritan, half-breeds, and they were kicked out to Samaria around Mount Gerizim. And then back in 128 B.C., uh, the Jewish people burned down the temple at Mount Gerizim because they were angry at the Samaritans. Long feud. Jesus could have gotten by in life just fine without ever going there. So the fact that he went there, he had a purpose. Showing the gospel is open to even the enemies of the Jews. And there he's by himself. The disciples go to town to get food. And a woman comes along. This woman has three strikes against her. One, she's a woman. The second, she's a Samaritan, an enemy of the Jews. Jesus should not talk to her because she's a woman. He should not talk to her because she's a Samaritan. The third strike, as they're having their conversation, Jesus tells her to go find her husband. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, well, you told me the truth. You do not have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Why would a woman in Jesus' day live with a, a man? Well, a woman had no means of support. She needed a man for a place to stay, uh, for just to survive. Five husbands. Now, the church over the centuries, especially the early church, considered this woman to be uh, a, have a sordid life because of five husbands. I have known widows that have outlived four husbands. Now, she could have outlived all those husbands, or they could have divorced her. She had no power over that. So she's been given a little bit of a, a, a bad press. Nonetheless, someone with five husbands Jesus is talking to, and she's now living with a man who's not her husband. Jesus says, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask him to give you water where you'll never go thirsty. She says, we're waiting for the Messiah. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. She goes running off. The disciples come. They're, it's an awkward moment. They don't know what to say. The woman goes running off. Even leaves her water jug to the city, the village, and tells all the people, I have met someone who knows me through and through. Could he be the Messiah? And the delegation from town goes out. Jesus goes back and spends two days there. What does this teach us? There's all kinds of things in this text. 
I think the first thing that we need to realize is something that uh, Ron Rollheiser uh, came to understand. He was, um, Ron Rollheiser is a um, college professor, Roman Catholic priest. And he said when he was first in the ministry, he was serving in a church that had a pastor that was 84 years old. And people loved this man and they loved to go to him for confession. And uh, Ron Wilheiser at the time considered him almost a saint. And he, said to, he asked him a question. If you had your ministry to do over, would you change anything? And this old priest said, yeah, and Ron Wilheiser was shocked. He thought this man would say, no, I wouldn't change a thing. And this man said, no, I would change something. I would be easier on people the next time. I wouldn't be so stingy with God's mercy. I wouldn't be so stingy with God's grace. And then he said, you see, I had it drilled into me, the phrase, the truth will set you free. And I believed that it was my responsibility to challenge people so as to protect something inside of them. That's good. But I fear I've been too hard on people. They have pain enough without me and the church laying further burdens on them. I should have risked God's mercy more. Von Roheiser, now older than me, says, I ref when I reflect upon my life, I remember when I was first ordained, being pulled off to the side and being told by my superiors, be hard on those people. And he says, now, I understand the wisdom of that 84-year-old priest. Don't be so hard. Don't be stingy with God's mercy in God's grace. It's God's grace and mercy that's our living water. Oh, I could, Brendan Manning uh, goes on and says the same thing. The one thing Christians tend to overlook more than anything else is grace. God's grace is overwhelming and relentless. When I was in my first congregation, I had a woman who came to worship and uh, she was already a member of another congregation. I knew it. And the members of my congregation knew it. And she came to worship and I talked to her and I said, uh, you know, thank you for being here. Why are you here? She said, I want to come to this church. And I said, but why? You have your own church. Don't you think you'd be more comfortable there? And she said, not since my divorce. Now that I'm divorced, I had a call from a woman in my Bible study group who said that they had yearly dues, who called up and said, your dues are, are due, this is the amount. Uh, you don't have to attend. She said it was just like I was being disinvited, that they wanted my dues. She said, just because I was divorced. I couldn't help it. We need, as Christians, to learn to be gentler. Don't be stingy with God's mercy and grace. Living water. Now let's look at God for a second. God is the one who knows you in Christ, through and through. Knows every single thought, every single action, every single sin. Oh, he knows the good things too, but all those bad things. Can you imagine? Martin Luther said of that. In every creature, God is deeper, more internal, and more present than the creature is to himself. 
Doesn't that blow you away? God is more, is deeper, more internal, more present than I am to myself. God knows me that well. That is what frightened Martin Luther about God. In fact, he said this, I did not love God. I hated the just God. And I was indignant toward him. But then he realized, just as the Samaritan woman realized, he knows everything I've ever done. And Martin Luther realized, because of God's mercy, it was a good thing. A tender thing, because God still claimed him as his own. Paul Tillich put it this way, God is inescapable. He is only God because he is inescapable. And only that which is inescapable is God. Isn't that something? Only that thing that is inescapable is God. That's why Paul Tillich called God the ground of my being, so deeply in me, so intimately connected, knows me so well. But the living water is. He claims me, yet, as his own. Because of the grace won through Jesus Christ, he loves me as his own. That's the living water. The water the world is thirsting for. Amen.